Good morning, everyone. We want to get started here this morning. As you can see, we kind of gave most of our praise team the week off. Poor Tyler didn't quite make the cut, though. Sorry, Tyler. But uh, we can still praise the Lord. We don't need them to praise the Lord. Isn't that right? Amen. That's right. We also have communion this morning. We want to celebrate the precious gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. So please stand. Join us in singing this morning. There is joy in the Lord. Just a few moments this morning to welcome one another, okay? Thank you. Okay, stay standing, please. Jesus, hope of the nations.
Very, very glad to have you here. Uh, this is the time of the year where we get ready to uh, head into the fall activities uh, as we get ready after Labor Day. And uh, out at the Welcome Center, out at the Welcome Center, there's a couple, two or three sign-ups out there. One is uh, our Nursery 2s and 3 schedule for this next year. Many of you are on that schedule already. But if you would like to be, we've just got a few spots left that... Uh, that uh, we could use some help. So that's out at the Welcome Center. Also out at the Welcome Center, it talks about it in the bulletin. From time to time during the year, we uh, do different events where we need food brought in or uh, maybe do a funeral luncheon or help in the kitchen during some activity. And if you could sign up for um, a block of time where you may or may not get called, uh, we could use your help. That is out at the Welcome Center. Last year, this list completely filled up. You may or may not have been called, depending on the activities that we have. Um, just tell you one thing that we do is anyone that has a funeral here at First Baptist Church, we provide a luncheon. It's just one of those things that, that we do. And uh, uh, it's a tremendous, tremendous blessing to the families. Uh, built a lot of bridges through the years. It's one of those things that we do. But we, we, uh, we, we purchase some things through the offerings, but we also... Uh, need volunteers and some food brought in. So if you can help out in that, uh, out at the Welcome Center. Also, also in your bulletin, a couple of ladies' Bible studies starting uh, after Labor Day. One is on Thursdays in the morning, and uh, one is on Mondays at night. Also sign up out there, or there's a couple of phone numbers in the bulletin for you to call if you're interested in that. Should be great. Should be great. That's coming up uh, after after Labor Day. We're going to take up the offering here in just a moment. There'll be the regular offering, and then right after that, there'll be a benevolent offering. That benevolent offering is used to help with gas and food and clothing, different needs that come through the office. Mark Riley, one of our deacons, is going to come, and he's going to pray this morning for the offering. Lord, thank you for watching over us this week. Thank you for providing for our needs. Thank you for the food we had to eat, Lord, this week, and the clean water we had to drink, and our homes. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for the generosity um, demonstrated in our congregation the last week at the rodeo for Ryan and the uh, matching gifts that was to us, Lord. Thank you for meeting our needs. I pray that you would bless this offering. Thank you for our jobs and the employment you've given us. In the name of Jesus. Belong. Tuck it all away like every 
everything's okay. Gonna make them all believe it. Maybe I'll believe it too. So with the pain and grin, I'll play the part again. So everyone will see me the way that I see them. Are we happy plastic people on the shiny plastic seagulls? With walls around our weakness, smiles that hide our pain. But if the invitation's open to every heart that has been broken, maybe then we close the curtain on our stained glass masquerade. Is there anyone who has been there? Are there any hands to raise? I'm the only one who's traded. The altar for the stage. The performance is convincing. We know every line by heart. No, no one is watching, and we really fall apart. Would it set me free if I dared to let you see the truth behind the person that you imagined me to be? Would your arms be open? Would you walk away? Or would the love of Jesus be enough to make you stay? Are we happy plastic people on the shiny plastic steeples with walls around our weakness and smiles to hide our pain? But if the invitation's open to every heart that has been broken, maybe then we close the curtain on a stained glass masquerade. Well, if the invitation's open to every heart that has been broken, maybe then we close the curtain on a stained glass masquerade. church today feeling so small it's a great song please stand join us once again your name
Well, good morning, and I uh, just want to say thank you for uh, joining and worshiping with us this morning. Got a few announcements that uh, um, were brought to my attention just a little bit ago. Chubb and Linda Hunt just wanted to thank you guys for praying for their daughter, Sabrina. Uh, her test results after the surgery came back really good. The lymph nodes are clear, and they're just really celebrating and excited. So thank you for praying for that. Also tonight, um, they're going to be a re-showing of the Dave and Karen Nienheist story here at 6 o'clock. I know we were in Chicago with a bunch of youth uh, and did not get a chance to see that. So 6 o'clock for the evening service is going to be the Dave and Karen Nienheist story. And I just encourage you to come back a second time and see it or uh, 
come again or uh, come in and check the, the the video out i heard it's really well done and just just very inspirational and then one other thing i want to uh, bring your attention to the fair is coming up in a couple weeks and uh we're always looking for people to help with the outreaches at the CEF um, tent. There's going to be another tent there last year and this year just to do some evangelism at the fair. So if you have any interest in uh, helping out in those two weeks, please, or during those weeks, uh, either one of those booths, please uh, look me up and we can talk about uh, maybe how you can partner with us at the Oceana County Fair in, in, in a couple of weeks. So. And I also just want to say thank you for the opportunity to preach again. I only get a few chances a year. I ran to the bathroom, I ran into a guy there, and uh, we're both uh, doing our business. And I said, yeah, it's going to be a long one. I only get a few chances, so I had to take care of it um, when we got. But no, just thank you for the opportunity um, to, be, to, to preach. Pastor Mark will be back next week. So let's, let's open with prayer. Father God, it's just a privilege to come before you and open your word, your holy living word. Father, just don't fear qualified to, to, to share, but Father, your words are true, they're powerful, they, they penetrate like a double-edged sword, so Father, I just pray for that this morning. Each one of us in this room has a spiritual need, it's different for each one of us, but Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will just take the words that are shared this morning and, and just touch us where we're at. Father, if there needs to be healing, I pray healing will happen. There needs to be just to, to, to spur us on to a new more obedience, and I pray that happens, Father. If we need just to fall more in love with you, I pray that happens this morning as well. Father, thank you for this opportunity, and I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, take your Bible and turn to Numbers chapter uh, 14, and we'll head there in a little while. We're going to be Numbers 14, um, Joshua 3, and then 1 Corinthians um, chapter 3 this morning. And an elderly man was just finishing up his doctor's appointment. He leaned over to the doc and said, I'm a little concerned. I don't know what to do, doctor. I am really certain that my wife is starting to lose her hearing. The doctor said, okay, this is what you need to do. Stand on the second floor of your home when you get home and yell a question at her. If she does not answer, then go to the main floor and yell her another question. If she still does not give you an answer, go right up beside her and ask her a question face to face. He was a little confused, but he thought about what the doctor said, and he drove home, and he went right up to the second floor of their house. When he got up there, he yelled down, Honey, what's for dinner? No answer. Nothing. Then he came down to the main floor, and in loud as voice as he could muster, he said, Honey, what is for dinner? Again, nothing. Absolutely nothing. So he, he was thinking, she's going down. Finally, he went down to the kitchen, found her, stood beside her, and said, Honey, what's for dinner? She looked at him and said, For the third time, chicken. Now that is where Israel was. They were out in the wilderness, and God had been speaking to them, and they could not hear what he was telling them. Or maybe they did not want to hear what God was asking them. Are you hearing what God is asking of you? Are you listening to God's voice in your spiritual walk with him this morning? So in chapter 13 of Numbers, I want to kind of pick it up. Now, last week I had the opportunity to preach, and we said goodbye to Aaron and Emily Van Dyne. And I would have liked to do these two sermons, kind of flip them around and do last week's, this week, and this week's last week. But I want to go back to Numbers chapter 14. God has brought the Israelites to the edge of the promised land at Kadesh Barnea. He has sent out 12 spies, and they came back with great reports, huge, huge bundles of grapes, great vegetation, beautiful scenery. It was an amazing land, great riches, and 10 of the, 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 the spies say mission impossible. We cannot conquer this land. It just can't be done. They were thinking it was up to them. They weren't seeing it through the, the father's lens. But two of the spies said, in the Lord's strength, nothing is impossible. Of course we can take this land. If God says it, 
it is our land. If God promises this land, it's our land. But when the people heard the report of the 12, they began to moan, they began to groan, they mumbled, they complained, they yelled at God, they yelled at Moses, they yelled at all the elders and the leadership, and they asked them, what have you done to us? Where have you taken us? You got us out into this horrible environment, the Sinai Desert. Now we have nowhere to go. We cannot go back to Egypt, and we sure cannot go to the Promised Land. This is just awful. So we pick it up in uh, Numbers 14, uh, verse 10. But the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb, the two spies that said that they could conquer the land. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me? Even after all the miraculous signs I have done among them, I will disown them and destroy them with a plague. Then I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they are. So Moses is taking out all this complaining from the people. Joshua and Caleb gave a great report. The people are saying, let's get rid of them. We can't do this. I don't know what they're thinking. They're not seeing God in this situation. So Moses is interceding on behalf uh, of, the, of the Israelites to, to God. So then we pick it up in verse 20 of the same chapter. This is God's response after Moses is interceding. Then the Lord said, I will pardon them as you have requested. But as surely as I live, and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people will ever enter into the land. They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I perform both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they have tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. They will never see the land I swore to give their ancestors. None of those who have treated me with contempt will ever see it. But my servant Caleb, Caleb has a different attitude than the others have. He has remained loyal to me, so I will bring him into the land he explored. Or that word bring is cross over into the land. We talked about that last week. Now, his descendants will possess their full share of that land. Now, turn around and don't go on towards the land where the Amalekites and the Canaanites live promised land. Tomorrow you must set out, or Nassau, out for the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. So how could ten men profoundly affect a whole nation? They came back from the promised land. They saw the same thing that Joshua and Caleb saw. It's the land that they've been waiting for for, for years. Abraham put a tamarack tree in that land years before as a promise that, yes, this will be the promised land someday. And all these ten men saw were big walls, professional military armies, a big river, raging river, the Jordan River to cross. They did not see God at all. They were not ready. These ten men were not ready to experience the Abar or crossover moment that God had for them at Kadesh Barnea. And because of that, God takes the whole country of Israel, somewhere around 2, 000, 2 million people, maybe 25, 2 million 500, we don't, we don't know how many people, and takes them back into the wilderness for another 40 years to learn a few more lessons. Nobody over 20 years old would ever get into that promised land besides Caleb. God was telling them, you guys need, as a nation, to become a cross-over people before you can have an Abar or a crossover moment. Remember what Abar was? We talked about that last week. Turn to Joshua chapter 3 just for a reminder. You can always go back and, and uh, listen to it online. Joshua chapter 3. Abar is a, it's a Hebrew word, but let me read it to you. Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove, or Nassau Acacia Grove, and we arrived at the banks of the Jordan River where they camped before crossing, or before abarring. So there's two word pictures here that God had painted for the nation of Israel. 
and, 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 and they're sitting at the banks of the Jordan River, about eight miles away, getting ready to cross into the promised land. And God, God was giving them this opportunity. So the first thing he says is, first, you need to leave where you're at by Acacia Grove. And you need to set out, or you need to Nassau over to the riverbank. And to set out, or Nassau means to, to set out, or the Hebrew culture as the set out ones. They were, they were Bedouin type people. They basically for 40 years were wandering around the desert. And the desert became home to them, even though it was an awful, uh, awful environment. That's who they were. That's what their identity. That's who the Israelites were. But God had so much more in store for the Israelites. That they just were not ready to cross over into the, into the promised land. The second word that we had was crossover or abar and in the last part of that verse where they camped before crossing and we looked at that a lot last week the word has basically 16 distinct meanings um, so so to really understand what god is getting at here you have to understand the context of why he wrote it and why he included this word here but generally in all 16 applications it means to cross over never to return again after crossing, you will never be the same again. And we see that over and over and over in Scripture. This is just not an Old Testament uh, word picture. We see it all the time in Scripture about crossing over something and never being the same again. But this generation of the Israelites had to be prepared to have this Abar moment. They had to be prepared. Their parents were not. Forty years earlier, their parents weren't ready to cross over. So that's why we find them wandering around the wilderness, being Nassau people for 40 years, never experiencing what God intended for them and what God had for them. So God took them out into the wilderness, and the whole goal of bringing them back into the wilderness was for them to fall more in love with God and to trust Him completely. Why? Why was that so important? So they can mature in their relationship with Him. That was the whole purpose of this. They were never intended to stay as Nassau people, wandering around. God kept bringing them up to the Jordan River and saying, Are you ready yet? Are you ready to cross over into the promised land, the land that I have given you? So the wilderness was an equipping time for the whole nation of Israel. An equipping time for when God would call them together and say, it's time. Are you ready? Are you ready as a group of people to enter into what I have already given you and already promised you time and time and time before? You see, that's the same with us. God is always preparing us for what lies ahead. It's part of who He is. It's part of how He cares for us. He gives us opportunities in our lives to become Abar people. But we need to be prepared. We need to, to, to take those opportunities and run with them. And once we become these, this, this Abar people, the crossover people, then we're prepared to have our Abar moments. We're prepared to be able to cross over. This generation that we read about in Numbers 14 did not hear what God was telling them, in the, what, what God was telling them. So he sent them into the wilderness. But this generation that we found in Joshua chapter 3, they have learned the lesson of the wilderness very, very well. And, and I think, we don't have uh, that much time, but I think there's three main lessons that God was teaching this generation of Israelites as they wandered around the wilderness. And the first one was to love God with all your heart. Love God with all your heart. So they, they were set out, left Kadesh Barnea, and they wandered around for 40 years. And as they wandered around, as they were walking around, they watched God make provision after provision after provision. Miracle after miracle after miracle. And when someone makes provisions for you, there's an affection that grows in your heart. It's just natural. If every day I went to pay my bills, and uh, bring it in. And they say, oh, no, Ryan, that's all right. You just keep your money. We'll pay that bill for you this, this month. Then I go back the next month, and they cover my bill again. And then the next month. 
And this pattern continued. Then the next year, I go back, and no, Ryan, we still got, you just keep your money. You, you, you need that. I'd say an affection would grow in my heart towards that person. Wouldn't you agree? I think it would, I think it would happen. And this is, this is how God was acting with the Israelites. God has been bailing them out from death moments over and over and over again in dramatic fashion. And he just says to them, just love me. Have no other gods before me. Just love me. Which in Hebrew is another way to say, just trust me. I've got your best interest in mind. Just trust me. Place your well-being in my hands. And I'll guide you. I'll lead you. We've been really busy the last few weeks working on this house, and I haven't spent much time with, with my kids as I was like, they're always running around, but not quality time. So I went to Lowe's on Friday. I took Easton, my, my, my six-year-old, and we're walking into Lowe's, and he slips his hand into mine. And we, we walked there, and I was thinking, that is just a perfect picture of God. Just taken by the hand, just walking along life together. Because he loves us. And I love Easton, and I love my children. So, because what God is saying, Israel, just love me. I'm going to take care of you. They also had to learn how to live by faith and not by fear. You get out in the Sinai wilderness. We talked about this a little bit last week. And quickly, you will experience fear. It's not a very pleasant place. 125 degrees at night, I mean during the day, it can drop down below 32 degrees um, by morning. And because of that, start hearing sometimes you can hear rocks starting to crack you just hear crack and then a few minutes later crack it kind of sounds like an earthquake just a real loud noise it's just kind of terrifying when you're out there they also no shade in the wilderness yeah there was a few acacia trees and a few other trees not much shade so what does God do he prospers their flocks and this arid environment, and they make tents out of their flocks. And they use animal skins for clothing. But the cold never wears out. Their shoes never wear out. God just says, I'm taking care of your needs. There's no water. Ah, I'll make water come out of the rock for you. There's no food. God's like, just watch what I can do. I'll make per perfect provision every day just enough food the Israelites had every single day. And then he said, and you know what? On the seventh day, I'm not even going to feed you because on the sixth day, I'm going to have enough food for you to make it through the seventh day. Because I want you to rest in my provision for you. Don't fear. Love me and trust me. And he's teaching the Israelites this lesson the whole time that they're in the wilderness. Stop worrying. Learn to rest in me and my provisions. I've already made them for you. And then he gets them out, to, out of Egypt. We can go back in history even further. With great power. They're trapped by the Red Sea. They're probably shaking in their boots. Here comes this army coming down to make mincemeat of them. As they, There's a Red Sea. What are you going to do? God says, don't worry. I've already got this figured out. I've got this plan. All you've got to do is trust me. All you've got to do is love me. Parts the Red Sea. They walk through on dry water, dry ground. And you know the stories. I don't have to read them all or tell you all the stories. But it's one miraculous provision after another miraculous provision after another miraculous provision. And God says, okay, here's the lesson I want you to learn. Don't be anxious. My love for you is so great. You can trust me and I will provide for you sufficiently. Three L's. Love God, learn to live by faith, not by fear, and learn to rest in God's provision. Same lessons he has for us today. Same reason we go through things in our life. But because the older generation did not learn these lessons well, when they are standing in Kadesh Barnea waiting to cross, the 12 spies go out, they come back. They just weren't ready to enter the promised land. They had not learned to be an Abar people. Can I just say to you, 
If you have not learned these three lessons, your Abar moments, your crossover moments will come and go, and you will miss out on amazing, great adventures that God has in store for you. Because we cannot cross over to what God has for us spiritually unless we embrace the full love of God, we learn to live by fear, and by faith, not by fear, and we know how to rest in His perfect provisions. God never, ever makes mistakes. He's never blindsided. He's got a perfect plan. But now there's this new generation that has emerged out of the wilderness. The children of those who did not embrace the three L's. But it does appear that this younger generation has learned the lessons of the wilderness. But they had paid it a tremendous price. Many of them have been in the wilderness for 40 years as a result of the spiritual leadership of their families, of their parents. And that probably more than anything else has been the biggest burden in my ministry life. Working with young people, working with singles, working with married couples who because of a spiritual legacy that their parents passed down to them have been in the wilderness for a very long time. When a student gets it and they see what it means to be an Avar person and they get tired of pretend Christianity and they want authentic Christianity, it's an amazing transformation to watch. The Holy Spirit grabs a hold of their hearts and the desire to become the type of people and they say, God, bring it on. I'm ready. I know you love me. I know you care for me. I'm going to trust you. No matter what comes into my life, bring it on. I'm here. I'm waiting. They actually know and they see the power of God. They see miracle after miracle after miracle. They rest in his provisions. And that's one thing as a youth pastor, I constantly want to paint a huge picture of who God is to the youth. And I want them to see what God's doing in my life. And the miracles that he's performing. So they say, man, look at what God can do. And when they do get it, it's visibly seen on their faces, in their body language. There's joy on their faces. There's joy in their spirit. We talked about that last week. There are people of joy. It doesn't mean that Abar people don't get tired. That they don't have problems. It does not mean that they are not down moments in our life. But Abar people recover so quickly because they are on a great adventure and they have learned how to cross over well because they are Abar people people, and they have been prepared. Now I think over the last two weeks I've driven this point home long enough from the Old Testament. And I think some of you have started to take ownership of it. I even had one one team this week say, hey, I had an Abar moment this week. My heart just went, yes, you got it. As you start looking at the events of every day, and start saying, hmm, that was a great Abar moment. Or, this is a Nassau moment for me. God is moving me on to new ground. God never moves you for the purpose of just keeping you moving. He is always moving you to a new level of spirituality, a new level in your relationship with Him. If you're not moving, you better check out your relationship with Him. A place, and this new level of spirituality, is a place in which everything is different. You start seeing God with a little clearer lens. You start living in high definition, as Ryan and Kendra start and they keep talking about. It's a place where you love God more, you trust Him more, and you rest in His provisions more. And Paul addressed a very similar issue with the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter um, uh, 3. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This church had experienced the set out part of it. They had been born again. It's a new church. A lot of born again believers. People who just accepted Christ. And, And God says, okay, church, you have a brand new life. But because you're Gentiles... 
this whole relationship with God, this whole relationship with me, is a new thing for you. It's something you've never experienced before. So I'm going to reveal myself to you, God is telling this, this church. So Paul found that once that this group, this church, that once they got set out, that kind of came their identity. All right, we're Christians. Now we can kind of just stay the same and not move forward. And he's like, no, there's so much more that God has in store for you. So in 1 Corinthians 3, chap chapter 1, ah, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Let me read that. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in the Christian life. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still are not ready, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. I mean, just stop right there. This, this version got it wrong. You do not have a sinful nature. A believer in Christ does not have a sinful nature. You have, we, we don't have two natures. We don't have a God nature and a sinful nature warring inside of us. We have flesh, but if you're a, if you're a, a born again believer, you have a brand new identity in Christ. The original word should be, should be flesh there. For you're still controlled by your flesh. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your flesh? Aren't you living like people of the world? Oh, that, last, that last little bit convicts me. Aren't you living like people of the world? And that's what disgusts so many non-Christians. Why would I want to have what you have? There's nothing different about you. In senior high, a couple weeks ago, we watched, uh, there's a documentary out right now called Beware of the Christians. There's four college kids that wanted to just go to England and just see what is God doing in England. And they're kind of just figuring out. And uh, so they're interviewing people as they go around in these different cities. And just about God and being a Christian. And, and they said, what's the difference between you and maybe one of your Christian friends as they went around? And the answer that came up a couple times is, oh, they're just busy on Sunday morning. That's it. Just busy on Sunday morning. Is that true of you? Are you just busy on Sunday morning and the rest of the week life is? You're not preparing to be an Abar people? Are you living like the people of the world? But Paul is telling the people, you've settled for cultural Christianity, not authentic Christianity. You haven't Abar. You're not crossing over. And because of that, they, stay, they were staying, this church was staying spiritually children all their lives. And if you stay spiritually children, you will walk mainly by the flesh, Paul is saying, and not by the Spirit. There is a point in our Christian lives where we have to believe in which God has already given us, our new identity. We have the Christ life living in us. Live it out. Once you start living out the Christ life, you get a little more muscle. You start, you start memorizing verses, and then you start praying those verses back to, back to God, and you start understanding it, and, and your faith starts to grow, and you fall more in love with Jesus, and you trust Him more, and there's more pro you see His provisions in your life, and how everything is Father filtered. And your neighbors start to take notice, the ones that aren't in church on Sunday morning or even the ones that might be in church on Sunday morning. What did Jesus say would set his people apart from the rest of the world? Love. By the way they love each other. And you see, if you're going to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh, you're going to have the fruit of the Spirit. You're going to have love, unconditional love, and joy, and peace, and patience, and goodness, and self-control. It's the same love that Jesus said to his disciples and those that were listening to him. Love your enemies and do good to them. Does that mean I got to be nice to my neighbor, the neighbor that's mean or to that boss last week? To the person that I want to throttle? Yes. God says, baby, 
immature Christian, NASA people, if you were an Abar person, if you were mature, if you were seeking out to become my type of person, you would look at that person that's mean to you and recognize whatever that meanness was, that they're probably hurting, that there's probably something going on in their life. And you'd see them differently. And the thing that they need more than anything else is pure, undefiled love from God. You know how they will respond? And not be right away. Eventually, they'll be, what is different about you? And they'll break down. They'll start asking questions. And at some point, I have the opportunity to share the gospel, to share Christ's love to them. And I say these things for the last two weeks. And for the most part, I went zoom, zoom, right over some of our heads. Went over my head for years. We're like Nassau people. And we start walking in the flesh again instead of walking in the spirit. Hey, I've been here before. I can handle this. Ah, it might turn out better. It never does. Hey, remember this? Ah, I can do this. It gets worse. It always gets worse. And Paul did not want this church in Corinth to be like Israel in the wilderness and miss the point. You start out as Nassau people. And by the way, you never stop being Nassau people. You keep moving. You keep growing. But just when you think you made a certain level spiritually, a kind of a certain plateau, God looks at you and says, Yeah, that's good. I see you change just a little bit. A little more love, a little more trusting, a little more resting in my provisions. Now let's go deeper. Now experience more of my love, more of my rest. And usually that requires bruising of some sort, some hardship, some suffering, a job that we thought we were going to get and we didn't get. A diagnosis, a family member, hard times. And then, God, why? why? Why is this here? And God's saying, because I want you to keep moving. I want you to keep moving and falling more in love with me. But what happens most often? We become bitter. We start asking questions. It's all right to ask questions, but we start blaming God for the things happening in our life. And then bitterness sets in, a spirit of bitterness. And we don't cross over well. There's no new ground, no new great spiritual adventures in your life. You will just plateau. Why? Because we did not have the right response when God says, hey, I'm moving you. So how are you doing with becoming an Abar person? Are you loving God more? Are you trusting him more? Are you resting in his provisions, his promises that he gave to us? Now, church, I want you to know that I love you. I have a great love for this, this church, the youth of this church, the youth of Oceana County. And we have a group of students that are becoming Abar people. There is a group. And that's encouraging and exciting to see that they're recognizing and walking through these Abar moments. But there are a great many others that have grown up right in this church who remain Nassau people. And it may not bother you as much as it bothers me, but I have to give an account before God someday for my teaching, for being a shepherd, for being a pastor. So it's no small thing for me to feel responsible for the responsibilities that God has given me. And it grieves me deeply, for the most part, that many of the teens are content to stay in Nassau people. And I think to myself, what can I say? 
What am I not doing that would help them recognize that they are just wandering around in the wilderness, not experiencing what God has for them? They already have the basics, already been introduced to God, but not really trusting Him. So I give this a ton of thought. When I came four years ago, there was a, a group a younger group coming up and I was just sure that God was going to use them to passionately ignite spiritual fire in, in, this, in this church in Oceana County. And what, they, what needs to happen is these younger generations need to start seeking and start seeing older generations who are seeking out to be Abar people and Abar moments, and then sharing them with the youth, with your children, with the kids you come in contact with. They need to see that our God is living. Why did God say last week in Joshua 3 that they were going to have this crossover moment? He says it, I think, in verse 10. So you will know that the living God is among you. And our younger generation needs to keep seeing these Abar moments happening on a regular basis as older people in this church. They need to see you loving God. They need to see you trusting God and resting in His provisions. And many of you are, and it's an amazing thing. But then you need to share it with the students and your kids. Don't separate it. Then we will start to see the next generation of youth become alive and passionate about the things of God. We said goodbye to a couple last week that was moving through these Abar moments. And you saw the relationship this couple built with teens over the last year. The teens were attracted to them because God was working in their lives. Now they're gone. They're in Iowa. They're not going to be part of the youth staff this year. So who's going to step up and be the next Abar couple to help out with the youth, the senior high, the junior high, the Iwana program? I want to share with you a story before we go into communion. They impacted me greatly maybe 20 years ago as I was just walking in my, in my Christian life. I really wasn't moving forward, just kind of going to church on Sunday mornings. Spirituality, I grew up in a church kind of where your, your relationship with God was a private thing and you really didn't talk about it much. Then I heard this one story. And I don't know if it's true or not. But it impacted me. And it really has nothing to do with an Abar moment. But it impacted me to start living my life to start impacting kids. The title of the story is, Who Wants Little Johnny? And uh, the story begins in a third grade elementary classroom on a warm spring afternoon. The teacher has turned her back to the class and is writing some assignments on the board. And little Johnny is sitting at his desk. And the more, the more he sat there, the more he began to dream. And the more he dreamed, it dawned on him that his surroundings were changing. And then, almost in an instant, his desk turned into a sports car. And there was a steering wheel in his hand. And without even thinking of the consequences, he started driving his car. Vroom, vroom, vroom. Vroom, just started driving. Vroom, 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 vroom. But almost in, immediately, as he was having a great time, the teacher spun around. And with some anger, she looked at Johnny and said, Stop that young man, you're disturbing the class. Then, having a little inspirational moment, the teacher walked over to Johnny and said, Son, what would you like to be when you grow up? Johnny thought about it for a moment, looked her in the eyes, and said, Well, ma'am. I would like to be a preacher. The teacher looked at him with considerable passion and said, Johnny, that is wonderful. That's a great calling. Now, if you're going to be a preacher, you need to learn self-control. You need to obey the teachers and authorities in your life. Can I count on you not to do this again? Yes, ma'am, you can. So she went back to the board and began writing the rest of the assignment on the board. 
Well, within a few minutes, I need to remind you. It's warm outside. It's a spring day. I think I was little Johnny. And Johnny's mind very rapidly began to wander. And before he knew it, his sports car reappeared on his desk. There was a steering wheel. Now this time, there's a stick shift. So here's little Johnny sitting in his car. He having just a great time. The teacher spun around in anger, walked up to Johnny. I said, Johnny, you stop that. She stared at him. I said, Johnny, what did you just tell me you wanted to be? He looked at her for a moment. And with a twinkle in his eyes, he said, Well, ma'am, I would like to be a gangster. A gangster, she said. Just a few moments ago, you told me you wanted to be a preacher. Now, this is the point of the whole story that became the driving focus of my passion for youth, the passion for following God and being an example to students. It was like an arrow that went through my heart. Johnny looked her in the face and said, Well, ma'am, it depends on who gets me first. It depends on who gets me first. Now God used that story to grab a hold of my heart as a young man in my early 20s that was just kind of floundering spiritually. Not moving forward. I'd go to church twice a Sunday. Yes, we had church twice a Sunday back then in the church I grew up. And just not growing, not passionate, not... Something happened in my heart when I heard that story. And I didn't know at that time that it was a major Abar moment that God was preparing me for. And I want you to know there's a battle for Johnny's heart still going on today. And it goes on over and over and over. Someone wants little Johnny's heart. I got a whole message just on this story that I'd love to share with you sometime. And I've been here for four years now. You guys do a great job with our kids. There's so many more. So much more there. And I believe our youth, especially our junior and our senior high, are at a crossover moment. They're standing there with both feet at the Jordan, ready to cross in. So are you an Abar person? Are you loving God more? Are you trusting Him more? Are you resting in his provisions? If you are, God's going to continue to give you Abar moments to have you walk through. And I would love for you to share that with the youth of this congregation. Declare what God is doing. And amazing things will happen. So this morning we've got communion at the Lord's table. We do this the second Sunday of every month as a reminder of Christ's love for us. And one of, the, one of the Abar moments, the guys can come forward. This will, won't be long before we start. Yeah. One of the first and most important Abar moments that you can have in your life, a crossover moment, is when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Every one of us has a choice. Are we going to turn our back on God? We live in America. There's very few people that have not heard the gospel message. Very few. So what have you done with it? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Have you said, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you created this world for more than how I'm living it now. I know you love me. Father, I want to trust you. And if you've done that, this table is for you. This table is a remembrance of what he's done for us. But if you haven't, now's a great time to do it. But a few years back, we had a teen accept Christ right there in the communion service. He came up afterwards and said, that's the first time I've ever taken communion. And his whole face was just radiant. Because he knew the price that God had paid for him. So this morning, I'm going to pray. And we're, 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 we'll walk through the communion service. Father God, I want this church to be full of Abar people that can take Abar moments and run through them. I love this church. I love the youth. I love the parents. But Father, I know this morning we all have spiritual needs. And 
there might be some sitting here that don't even know you. That there are questions right now. And Father, if this is a morning that you're calling them to become one of your children, I pray that this morning that they will accept you as their Savior. That they'll say, yes, Father, I love you. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for dying on the cross and rising again and destroying death, defeating Satan's power. But Father, I agree with your word, and I confess that you're my God. Father, for the rest of us as we remember, I pray that this remembrance will help stir us on to be of our people. Father, I love you. I thank you for Jesus' precious name.
killed for you and me to eat this remembrance of him.
have all the tea or anybody 20 years and younger stand up all right here's the next generation at this church I've been here like I said four years and I've noticed in the heart area there's a few Bible believing churches there are a few we have a major responsibility are you going to have an Abar are you going to be an Abar people so that this next generation can have an Abar moment have a great day